Welcome back to uh, paper session three on points and manipulation. And uh, I'm the session chair for this session, uh, Chris Wyman from NVIDIA. I've been asked to remind you all uh, to tomorrow think about uh, what the best paper presentation will be throughout the entire conference. Remember to vote uh, tomorrow on the uh, best paper presentation. Uh, the first paper in the points and manipulation session is I based point rendering for dynamic multi view effects uh, by Ajinkya and uh, uh, Gavani. Gavani. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ben Watson. Uh, and uh, take it over. Uh, my name is Ajinkya, and today I'm going to present our work on I-based point rendering for multi-view, uh, for dynamic multi-view effects. So here's the agenda for today's presentation. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, motivation, show up some results up front, uh, discuss the contributions, and then walk you through the algorithm and the applications, and finally wrap up with conclusion and discussion. So starting with motivation, uh, to render the realistic images, uh, we either need to uh, ray trace or generate multiple off-screen views. Note that off the on-screen views means the view that we see from the camera, and the off-screen views is viewing the same scene from different position and orientation. And the, this presentation will primarily focus on the reflections and the shadows. So reflections on the right, left, and shadows on the right. And these effects require at least two distinct views, such as in reflections, we need to have like 360 degree view with the camera placed at the center of the reflector, or we can also like map the, reflect, um, the reflections on a square texture on the, of the cube map. And for shadows, we need to put a, light, put a camera from the light point of view and record the scene. So yeah, uh, we need to generate like multiple views uh, and have like multi-passes throughout the geometry to generate these effects. So we implemented a uh, dynamic and moment mapping. This is a sponsor scene, uh, which has like 1.2 million polygons. And this scenes we have like 50 reflective objects, each uh, having generating like six unique views. So total there are like 300 views that is being rendered. And our algorithm takes like 26 to 26.9 milliseconds, while a standard multi-pass rendering takes about 240 milliseconds. And we call our technique as I-based point rendering, or EPR. And here's the video with side by side, where ours is on the on your left, and standard multipass on the right. Um, here's one more. This is a gallery scene with the same configuration. Both has 50 reflective objects generating 300 off-screen views. Oh, there was a lag. It's not on the video. <laughs> so yeah, uh, ours uh, uh, take, take rate like 30 milliseconds, whereas standard multipass took about 139 milliseconds. So yeah, um, coming to the contribution, following our, our contribution, so we introduced I-based point rendering, which generated faster dynamic and moment mapping reflections. And then we introduced I-based deferred shading, which drastically reduced the off-screen shading in the reflections. And we applied our technique to environment mapping and omnidirectional shadows. So coming to our technique, but first I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to what is multi-view rendering, MVR, and what is view-independent rendering. So in a multi-view rendering or MVR, um, for each view produced, we uh, traverse the geometry, we transform it, we sample it, Z buffer it, and then produce the images. So to generate like N views, we have to do N traversals through the geometries. And so the N, we invoke, a, invoke the pipeline for N times. And later for quality comparison, we use this MVR uh, rendered result at four times the resolution uh, as a gold standard. And view independent rendering is a point based render where the geometry, where um, that generates like multiple views through a single pipeline pass. And the way it does is that um, it samples the geometry into points and it generates for every frame, it converts uh, these polygons into points, then uh, splat these uh, points into multiple views in parallel and generate these off-screen views. 
And although VIR can be inefficient when these views are diverse, like in environment mapping, and, and also if the resolutions of these off-screen buffers differ. So we improved VIR and called it improved view independent rendering, or IVIR, where we uh, implemented more efficient sampling that reduced the point size. And we also take into consideration of the buffer size, which further reduced the number of points and also the sharing cost. And we achieved the speed up of like 19 times faster than the original VIR, and it was like three and a half times faster than MVR. So we're gonna compare our, our new technique results with this as well. So coming to our pipeline, this is a, like a pipeline at a glance. And we, this is EPR pipeline, and I'll go through each step one by one. So first we have input as a polygon. And then in the vertex shader, we process the polygon, process the vertices, apply the model transformation, and also conservatively compute the triangle view uh, visibility and in, for in the each views. And we create a bit string, which we later use in the bio pipeline. And next is the geometry shader, uh, where we set a triangle up for the view independent rasterization in the EPI view at a multi-sampling rate uh, needed for the triangle and project this triangle into point sampling buffer. So we'll discuss how this sampling rate we compute when I discuss the applications. Uh, to tell you in brief, the EPI sampling rate um, ensures that every uh, buffer pixel is sampled. And note that one sample may cover several eye buffer pixels, off-screen uh, buffer pixels, sorry. And the eye resolution sampling is the significant departure from the view independent re rendering because in view independent rendering, it ensures that every point, uh, every off-screen buffer pixel is sampled. And here we are ensuring every eye buffer pixel is sampled. And EPI point cloud is typically much less dense than view independent rendering because it details only on eye, view, eye buffer pixels rather than all the off-screen view buffer pixels. And we also do one more step. We aggregate all this triangle view visibility that we computed in the vertex shader stage and pass it to the next stage. Then the rasterizer generate the points for the EPR transform triangles. Uh, and each conservatively rasterized fragment becomes a point in the cloud. And then the fragment shader next puts all these points into multiple point buffers, which later we splat in the compute shader. Uh, the exact content of this buffer may vary based on what implementation we are doing. So however, at minimum you need the triangle vertices, the point centers, what is the splat length, and the shading information, and also the triangle view visibility string. And the compute shader processes all these points um, for each point and view pairing. Uh, the shader splats a point into the view buffer, views off screen buffer. And the reason we use compute is because it improves the speed and also it enables more aggressive defer shading that I will discuss later in the slide. Yeah, uh, let's adapt our EPR to environment mapping. And to determine the triangle sampling rate for environment mapping, we must determine what is the triangle's largest footprint uh, when reflected into eye view via any of the reflector. And to do this, we conservatively find the distance the light travels from triangle to the reflector to the eye, uh, which is the minimum of some of the distance from the, oh. wait, uh, I'm gonna use a pointer, yeah. There's a pointer, yep. So some of the minimum of the distance from I to the circumsphere of the reflector to the circumsphere of the triangle. And we use this distance to figure out what is the sampling rate uh, for that triangle. And the sampling rate is inversely proportional uh, to this distance. Uh, next, we constrained our EPR computation to the resolution of the off screen of the eye buffer. And in environment mapping, uh, there is little need to have number of pixels in the cube map buffer that exceeds than the, what the reflector is gonna project on the eye buffer. So we set the cube map resolution uh, for a reflective object. To do that, we project the bounding box of the reflector onto the view plane, and then have a bounding square on that view plane, which we use as a resolution of the reflector, of the cube map buffer for that reflector. And then we use the ratio of this uh, eye, resolution, eye buffer resolution to this computed cube map buffer resolution to further constrain the number of sam uh, sampling rate for the triangle. 
And as mentioned earlier, one eye pixel may span multiple off-screen buffer pixels, for which we compute a splat length in the world coordinate system. And we splat these points in the compute shader by conservatively, um, by projecting the splat onto the view plane and then conservatively uh, computing a bounding box around it and then just rasterizing it and fill every buffer pixel in the box with the identical color because and ultimately this box is just going to show as a one pixel on this I buffer. And our EPS off screen buffer are actually like a G buffer. So we are storing only reference to the points and point shading data rather than RGB colors. And thus it enables us for a deferred shading. And however, rather than deferring shading, deferred shading it all after all the points are splatted, we realize an additional significant uh, eye resolution efficiency. So by we deferred even further, we deferred it at the final eye pass uh, deferred shading. So uh, consider this scene, the breakfast scene, and I want to uh, get your attention to this uh, jug reflector over here. And I'll show you the pixel that EPI shades to generate the reflection for this uh, jug. The picture, sorry. And so we shade the off-screen pixels only if they are reflected onto the ob on the reflect on the eye pixels. And here's the reflection map for the jug from the uh, previous slide. And this is one of the phase. So we have um, we uh, reflect the rays. We see which uh, point it uh, is uh, referring to. We get the data. We shade it and we store it again. And so all the white pixels, color pixels over here are the pixels which never get reflected. So we save a lot of computation in shading over here. And we tested it out on our, the sponsor scene. Uh, so ours, this, this uh, performance is on RTX 3070 GPU. And ours took like 27 milliseconds. Uh, IVR took like 580 milliseconds and MVR took 240 milliseconds. And here's a close-up view of the same scene. Uh, the execution time of ours for this is 44 milliseconds. IVR took like 840 milliseconds and MVR is still 240 milliseconds. And now here's the perceptual difference uh, between EPR, IVR, and MVR against the MVR four times the resolution. And note that the warmer color means more perceptually dif perceptual difference that will be noticed. And I want to uh, get your focus on this reflection, uh, this area of reflection. And our EPR technique uh, also preserves like details, which um, like you can see the flagpoles over here, which are, and also the at the edge of the spheres, which get washed out in IVR and MVR due to MIP mapping. And here's the gallery scene with the same configuration. Uh, ours renders in 30 milliseconds, IVR takes like 700 milliseconds, and MVR takes 139 milliseconds. And this also has like 50 reflector objects generating 300 views, every frame generating points for each frame, new points for each frame. And here's a close up view. Uh, EPR takes 65 milliseconds in this case, IVR takes 274, and MVR takes 139. As you can see, EPR got a lot slower because it generated more points while on older GPU like 1080 Ti, which has higher bandwidth, it didn't slow down this much as it did on RTX 3070. And here's a visual comparison of our technique uh, against, and all the techniques against the MVR four times the resolution. And again, note that warmer color means more visually perceivable difference. And in this, the EPR shows more warmer color than the rest when compared against the and we are 4x, and we believe it might be a good thing. Uh, so let's focus on this area of reflection first. So you can see like EPR preserves like a lot of details, like the railing over here, it's preserving details and also the chair, and where it gets like washed out and thinned in the reflections. So these are the differences which, you, which cause the warmer colors in the EPR technique. So here's a video of ours versus MVR side by side this doesn't lag. <laughs> yeah. So ours is running in like real time 30 FPS, 30 uh, milliseconds, and MVR is taking like 270 milliseconds. Sorry, 240 milliseconds. And this is a gallery scene. 
this is definitely not the this is a connection the hdmi not the videos <laughs> but yeah and here's the breakfast scene which is on 1080 titan um, nvidia 1080 and this scene has like 2.5 million polygons it has 50 reflective objects some objects are touching the surfaces which gets like very close to the uh, reflect objects being reflected yep so our filtering approach um, we also need to have filtered the reflections so our filtering approach uh, assumes that the normal under the eye pixel changes regularly and the material is unchanging and when we generate the g buffer for the eye we also store the gradient information with each eye pixel and when there is a like reflective object and use this gradient adjusted normal to calculate reflection vectors of the super sampled eye pixel and we believe that this approach may become maybe like more accurate than map mapping since it customizes sampling to each eye pixel rather than the um, approximating it over the image pyramid. Anyhow, um, it also enabled us with a, a recursive reflection. So this is a simple scene with the Sponza, and here we are recording um, the deferred shading time for the bounces of reflection. So here the first bounce reflection, then we have the second bounce of reflection, and this all has been done without no extra additional geometry pass. And then we have like third bounce of reflection. And here's the video where you see like it switches from one bounce, one bounce reflection to two bounce reflections and to three bounce reflections. And the third, yeah. And the next I'll show you the breakfast scene, which has 50 reflective objects. And I, this video is slowed down 10 times so that you can see the reflection properly. Yeah, all is this like generating points every frame and generating this reflection dynamically. And you can see that there are like recursive reflections on this jug over here. So we then try to extend our EPR to omnidirectional shadows. And in reflection, we can estimate the sampling rate by approximating the distance reflected from triangle via reflector to the eye. But in a shadows, it's not that simple. Um, we cannot, we need to, in shadows, we need to approximate the two distance. The one is from light sample to the receiver and eye to the receiver. But receivers are not well known in the dynamic scenes. So we use an intermediate and closing surface. Uh, we call it triangle shadow capsule. And we found the distance between eye to the shadow capsule and light sample to the shadow capsule and use the ratio to determine the sampling rate for the triangle. And here's are the results. So our implementation uh, took about 20 milliseconds. IVR took uh, 21 milliseconds and MVR took 32 milliseconds. And these improvements are modest. Uh, and the, one of the reason being is like, most of our gains are from saving up on the shading and in shadows, there is not much shading to do. So uh, coming to conclusions. Uh, so we introduced eye-based point rendering and we reduced the points by four times then IVIR, making reflections a lot faster. We also introduced a deferred shading, eye-based deferred shading, where it reduced the off-screen shading up to like 50 times and also allows no pass recursive filtering, uh, recursive reflections. We applied EPR to environment mapping and omnidirectional soft shadows. And for environment mapping, we gained a speed up of like 6.7 times than MVR. Coming to the limitations. Um, so EPR works best when the mapping to eye to the off-screen buffer is fairly tight, like in reflections. And it's most effective when we can like defer large eye pixel shader loads across many buffer pixels. And also, the when we sample a triangle, we want to triangle to fit into our point sampling view buffer, else it will get clipped. So that's one of the uh, constraints we have. And also on the modest GPU like NVIDIA RTX 3070, we encounter bandwidth limitations 
But we believe like if we use the higher end GPUs, uh, we will get even faster uh, performance, like 3080 Ti. And in future, we plan to extend our EPI to other multi-view effects like defocus blur and motion, motion blur. And we also plan to examine EPR for foveation and light fill displays. Um, yes, thank you for your attention. So the second talk in the session is entitled Unfair Translation of 3D Point Clouds with Multi-Part Shape Representations. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Yishan Ning. Uh, I'm from National Yangming Jiaohong University from Taiwan. And uh, it's my great honor to present our work about compare translation of 3D point clouds. And uh, in this work, we use so called multi part shape representation. And uh, so uh, I, I know there's a lot of uh, rendering experts here. And so, uh, but I guess not all of you may be familiar with this topic. So perhaps let me uh, briefly introduce this background, uh, the concept, and uh, then we will introduce our work, our contribution, and uh, then our method. And uh, so uh, let me give you uh, the brief concept about what we are working with. The first one is, uh, what is the domain and uh, what is so-called a shape transfer? So for instance, if we have a set of uh, shape, three shape, we share something in common, such as this is the underweight person. And uh, so our uh, uh, domain transfer, it means we would like to transfer, for instance, from one uh, such as underweight person to uh, its counterpart, its uh, overweight uh, counterpart. And uh, so it's uh, not really have to such as a human or a car or something. It can be some, uh, the, the domain could be substantially different, for instance, but they ha have to share something uh, correspondence. So for instance, uh, in the right, there's uh, like, just like uh, a cheese cookie, but it's actually the uh, plant skeleton, uh, or you can say the media axis of the plant. And uh, if we would like to do this kind of transfer, we can transfer, for instance, from the plant skeleton to the solid uh, shape of the plants. And uh, so it actually has been worked for decades. And for conventional uh, weight, we have to, for instance, find explicitly find a correspondence, such as the, uh, the point of a finger, tip of fingers, or, or your chase or something to map to the overweight persons from the under to, to, uh, to the overweight. And uh, then we can craft the so-called mapping function to, to map lens, just like uh, there are various kinds of mapping function. And then nowadays we have more and more such as machine learning and deep learning technology. So uh, one of the intuitive way to deal with then is perhaps we can collect a lot of data and then we can ask uh, deep neural network to help, help us to deal with everything. Uh, for instance, we can regard the input of the underweight person as uh, uh, input, and the output is overweight person. And uh, we can act, uh, regard the DNN, DCN as a black box, and uh, they always uh, uh, figure out everything, just like uh, the mapping function. However, uh, uh, if we have to do such weight, we have to, because we, we require some supervised learning, such as uh, from the underweight to overweight, but this uh, kind of difficult to collect this kind of data, right? And, uh, and sometimes some of the mapping is uh, actually invisible to, to, uh, to get. And uh, fortunately, there is uh, uh, some breakthroughs in uh, starting from the image field, such as uh, Cyclegain, I guess uh, it's, it's a big name. So it's, uh, you know, uh, it probably is that, for instance, if we have uh, such as a horse figure, we would like to map turn lane into uh, Libra ones. So, but we don't have actually the mapping between the Libra to the horse. Uh, otherwise, our artists have to uh, prepare a lot of data. Right? And it's quite difficult to create. So it's idea is that we can first transfer to the uh, Libra first and then transfer back to the horse as long as the uh, we so-called cycle uh, transfers uh, horse is similar to, for instance, a cycle transfer horse is similar to, wait a second. The, the cycle uh, transferred horse is similar to the original one. 
we can regard this as a point of valid one. And make, uh, with this kind of technology, we can save a lot of uh, data frequentation. So this kind of what is so-called so unpaired uh, translation. So we don't have, we don't need to do the, the pair translation, uh, pair data. And uh, uh, for a Swedish app uh, in 2000, uh, in 2019, uh, he and other proposed a method called uh, Logan in SQL Asia and uh, extend this idea to uh, Swedish space. So its idea is that perhaps we can prepare, so, uh, so it's many deal with the chair and table. That is because uh, when we deal with the Swedish app, there's a big data set called uh, ShapeNet, and uh, there are actually two biggest uh, uh, category, that is chair and table. So, so we can see a lot of work working on chair and table, that's because that is the biggest category yeah, in data set. And uh, so the idea is that perhaps we can put, uh, encode those chair and tables into the same common latent space, and then we can uh, figure out, uh, use a translator to figure out how to transfer from, so for instance, from a chair to, to the table and uh, vice versa, yeah. And uh, so uh, it's, it is an impressive work and, uh, and we actually be uh, inspired by this work. However, when we, uh, uh, deal, uh, when we use this kind of technology, we find there are some limitation or some weakness. Uh, the first thing is it try to use uh, 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 single, see, even though you use uh, such as multi-scale technology and some other technology, and try to represent this shape, but uh, we find that when then, for instance, regenerate the, the shape, we then use a so-called generator. This ge ge then use a single generator to generate uh, such as a table or a chair. We find there are some effects such as in uh, the following, you can see that when we transfer from the so-called uh, 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 on this chair to its uh, armchair uh, counterpart, we find that, okay, the chair leg number will not be identical. And the sound of the chair shape is uh, different and there are some noise. And uh, there are another work, recent uh, work by Chen and other and uh, proposed the so-called units in CVPR 2022. And they try to improve this idea. So they, instead of use a point cloud, then try to use so-called neural implicit functions. So its idea is try to uh, separate the space into such as some uh, volumes and try to use uh, SDF to represent the shape and uh, is uh, in, uh, improve the, the quality of, of the translation. Yeah, but we also find that there are actually has some fun because uh, if we use uh, such as uh, sign distance functions and some of the uh, scene or scene bar or some structure cannot be well preserved. And so, in, so let's go back to our work. So our work try to uh, do the shape to shape translation and we mainly deal with uh, three data sets. The first one is chair to table and the uh, on to on list and the tall to short. The, the, the lower two part is actually mainly for validation because it, they are relatively easy for, for us to validation. And uh, so what we want to preserve is first one, uh, if, for instance, if we have a chair here, we try to uh, preserve its uh, special, uh, its unique characteristics, such as the square uh, base of the chair or the four uh, branch of the chair base. And uh, we also hope that our translation can preserve the so-called domains feature uh, characteristics, such as, for instance, our armchair should have an arm, and the armless chair should not have the arm. And uh, uh, during our uh, experiment, we find that uh, we, we also think about that if we uh, in Logan and try to use a large generator to generate the, the corresponding, uh, to generate the shape. However, we find that it's relatively uh, slightly difficult for the generator to learn the detail. So our main idea is that perhaps we can change the uh, big generator into some uh, smaller one. That means we can decompose the whole shape into some, uh, relatively smaller part and then try to use those smaller parts to learn, uh, dedicate learning sound transformation. So that is the first issue. And the second one is that uh, our original idea is for instance, try to use some semantic segmentation to segment such as the, the leg or some uh, chair back or something, but we find that is invisible because uh, we have to collect uh, more data for, for them. So we uh, decide to 
try to make our network automatic learn how to segment those small parts and uh, automatic learn how to transfer them. Yeah. So that is what we want to do. And we think that when we decompose a bigger generator into a smaller part and then uh, uh, transfer them, uh, dedicate and do their, their job, and then we can use a refinement model, we call it a part aggregation, try to refine those uh, parts and uh, make them uh, 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 combining together as a better one. Yeah. And here, let me briefly show you some result. So for the top row, the, the first row is the input data. Uh, and uh, we here we show you the chair to table and table to chair. And here's our result. And here's the Logan and the units. They are two state of the art. And uh, uh, we can find that uh, the units uh, works result is actually uh, quite decent. But then some of the a uh, seamed bar or uh, or or armchair may be missing, just like those one. And uh, for Logan, sometimes the function and then some of the detail characteristics, such as the, the branch of the chair, may not be preserved. And uh, in this case, for instance, the bar between the chair leg may, may be missing. Yeah. And uh, our our result is uh, in the third, uh, second row. Yeah. Okay. So let's quickly go to our uh, uh, framework, but I will not go through the detail. So our, our idea is so-called uh, uh, part to hold network. We will try to decompose the problem, trans trans problem into some smaller parts. And then afterward, we can gather the, uh, re gather them together, yeah. And uh, so uh, for in whole, uh, it's quite complex. So, so uh, if you are interested in that, you can, uh, we can uh, for instance, discuss later or see the paper. But our idea is that perhaps we can uh, extract, uh, uh, for instance, the geometry feature from multiple scales, such as uh, we can, for instance, given a point, we can find their neighbors and form some uh, graph, uh, graph. And we can use a uh, uh, graph neural network to find their feature. But we also construct the graph in different scales, such as we can use KN to find their 15 neighbor, 20 neighbor, 25 neighbor, or something to find a different scale and different receptor field. And we can uh, get more uh, rich for feature for transfer. And uh, we also uh, utilize such as transformer and some other technology to, to improve the encoding. And uh, afterward, uh, the first steps, we use the encoder to extract uh, latent code. And then our feature mapper will automatic learn how to separate. For instance, we can assume that uh, use such as 60 smaller part. For instance, we can use four to uh, make one such as uh, 32 of a uh, small part. And those feature extract will automatic learn how to extract the content or feature from the, the as we so call the whole feature to the smaller or part feature. Yeah. And afterward, after the uh, extraction, then here uh, a smaller generator will try to uh, transfer from a feature to the uh, point cloud. And then afterwards, uh, we use so called a, a part aggregation module. This idea is that instead of generate a point again, once again, uh, we in this part, we try to move those points. For instance, uh, for instance we have 16. Uh, uh, 16 point part, and uh, we have a uh, part aggregator, then have the knowledge of the uh, global view, and then try to move those uh, points uh, and uh, see this each one together. So, uh, so that is uh, our another uh, design here. And uh, for a translator, is uh, our concept is similar to Logan, so I will not go through the detail. But uh, in our work, instead of use of uh, a holistic uh, loss function for land because we have module part. So we ask our part, uh, for instance, extend the idea of cycle consistency, for instance, the Libra and the uh, horse, and horse to Libra, this idea. So we hope that our transfer, such as from chair to uh, from chair to table, table to chair, when they use the cycle uh, reconstruction, we hope that their feature will be similar in the part levels. Uh, instead of the, the global level, but we actually combine those uh, global feature and the part feature together to make our uh, learning more efficient. 
And uh, most of the feature we have a uh, global part and the uh, uh, partial part. Yeah. Uh, skip some details. And let's go back to our, uh, go to our experiment. Yeah, so uh, we actually, uh, we use three, three kinds of data set. The first one is uh, the chair and table. That is the main uh, shape uh, category in the shape night. And uh, we also use the arm to arm list. This is easier for us to uh, uh, verif uh, verification. And the uh, uh, full table to short table. And uh, our training we will take about uh, 30 hours for data sets such as uh, uh, table to chair. We will take about 30 hours training on uh, Nvidia uh, 3090 uh, graphics card. And, but it's, it can be performing at an uh, interactive rate. We will show you the, 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 the number. And uh, so we compare our result with two state of the art. First one is Logan, as I've mentioned, and the uh, recent Unist. And uh, so here, uh, again, show you another, uh, some other qualitative uh, results. That means that we can see that, uh, again, Logan can make a chair, for instance, its input could be a five leg, and now it become an octopus leg chairs. Yeah, but uh, uh, but the, the, the chair back is good, yeah. And uh, for some base, where you can see that some of the uh, base tube uh, of the units may not be well preserved, and because they use uh, such as uh, scientists and function, and have some limitation in uh, resolution. Uh, of course, it can increase the resolution. Yeah. And our work is uh, above here. And uh, so that is a qualitative uh, result. And uh, we have more details and more results in our papers and supplementary material. And uh, for, for instance, from a tall table to show table, we can preserve, uh, of, but we still miss some details, such as in this case, this table have actually two bars. Uh, in the bottom, but we actually only recreate one, and otherwise nearly uh, stitch to the, the, the other one. Yeah. And then we also, uh, be before we go into the quantitative uh, evaluation, let me show you uh, some example about retrieval. Uh, why do we have to do that? Because someone may say, okay, you, you have training something, but uh, what if what is your uh, model actually do? Do you simply retrieve something? So. So we have to verify this one. So uh, this row is the input row. This is our result. And uh, we try to retrieve the, uh, the coldest data shape from the data set and to verify that our result is not simply a retrieval. So you can see that this one, this row zero is trying to retrieve from the input data. And uh, this row is trying to retrieve from uh, our result. And you can see that our result will be substantially different to some of the uh, uh, chief result from the data set. And uh, so you can see this one is actually uh, generate something new, uh, not simply uh, blending or not, uh, it's uh, or, or uh, shape or shape is shape. Yeah. And uh, and let's uh, see the quantitative results. And we act, we also perform the, uh, because uh, for shape transfer is actually quite, or even the image transformation is uh, actually quite difficult to evaluate its accuracy. But there are some uh, data sets such as uh, on to on this is relatively easy for us to evaluation because white point here, for us we can find the this point here, uh, big, but if we can, for instance, ignore those, those, those uh, um, sets, then perhaps we can get some uh, evaluation with the uh, accuracy. So compared with Logan and Unis, our result is uh, better than theirs. So these two values are reported on the uh, paper. And uh, here I show you some performance reports. So uh, uh, our uh, result, if we say we use about 30 hours for training, but for testing is quite uh, not so uh, GPU consumption. So it only uh, spend around, uh, consume around uh, nearly 1.9 gigawatts uh, video range. And uh, because our model is really uh, smaller, so to compare with Logan, we use relatively smaller uh, amount of memory, uh, 
but uh, for humans, it's actually uh, use uh, maybe because they use HDF, but its memory usage is actually uh, lower than ours. Uh, we are close, but it's lower than ours. However, uh, when men have to do some sampling things because they are used the implicit uh, function. So for test time, our test time is uh, substantially faster than the humans. And uh, uh, we think that if we, for each, when they're given the point, uh, a point set, and then we, after the transformation, we spend less than a quarter of a uh, second. So we think this is uh, efficient for, uh, can, can be used for entire uh, rate uh, operation, yeah. And so uh, let me conclude my work. So in this world, we propose a part to hold architecture. Uh, our goal is try to do the unpaired shape uh, translation. And in this framework, we propose uh, uh, to compose the uh, holistic generator, for instance, a big one to a, a smaller part and then aggregate them together. So we have a multi-part shape representation and we also have a car aggregation module to improve our result. And uh, in the future, we would like to further uh, study a more advanced framework and uh, we hope that one day can be extended for some uh, intelligence uh, model editing. Uh, currently, we have shown some uh, preliminary result, but we think it still has some uh, potential to be extended. And uh, so this is the last slide, and uh, thank you for your listening. We have time for questions, so please uh, raise your hand if you have questions. I am uh, Tomer from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, how do you pick these pairs you translate from? So you have a tall table, a short table. Like I would imagine if you pick a different table, it will fail. So is there any kind of failure point here, like in terms of limitation of the algorithm? And second point, how kind of sensitive is it? Like, for example, if I have like a, a, a to detail, so if I have like a chair, which is very modern and a very old fashioned chair, will it recognize the differences? Or so maybe I can use it for say style transfer between the chairs. Um, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, uh, we have, we, I have not mentioned this limitation. The first one is because we have to encode the data into a latent space and then record. So if uh, some uh, feature is relatively rare and it could be ignored during our encoding. So, and, uh, uh, but uh, in most of, uh, in a lot of cases, we, we do not restrict our shape or content. And uh, Another limitation of this work is that uh, because our network tries to implicitly find correspondence, so we do not assign anything. It will uh, then we explicit find implicitly find the, uh, the implicit transformation inside. And uh, however, some of the feature points in, uh, in the chair may not be mapped to the table, or in some more uh, integrated set such as from the, the table uh, or the chair to the airplane or something. And uh, if in that case, our model may not learn the implicit mapping. So in, that, in those cases, then it may not work. Yeah. It may simply change the shape or the size. I'm not sure whether I answered the question. Style change. For example, you have an old fashioned chair and a modern chair. Would your framework be sensitive enough to do that kind of translation or? We, in, in this world, we actually not uh, explicitly define the, the style. We simply hope that uh, our network can find some unique geometry and then transfer it to the object. And, uh, and so we do not do some explicit. Maybe, maybe we should talk offline. Thank you. We do have time for other questions. Does anyone have further questions? All 
All right, if not, let's thank our speaker one more time. So the third paper in the session is entitled Manny Loco, a VR-based locomotion method for concurrent object manipulation. And the speaker, well, the, the authors are Dan, uh, Dai, Dai Yu Wan. Yeah. Dai Yu Wan. I'm, I'm, I will apologize in advance. Shaoli Gao, Gao Shaoli, who's pre presenting. Uh, Li Don, Christos Musas, and Ling Ji Chen. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Xiao Lei Guo, I'm from Purdue University. Uh, so the first author cannot be here today, so I will present our study, uh, which is entitled Manilocal, a VR-based locomotion method for concurrent object manipulation. Uh, so first I would like to brief introduce uh, the background and the motivation of this study. Uh, because virtuality has been widely used for uh, laboratory, laboratory skill training, and as such, training tasks often involves a series of hand-based operations and it require users to move around and manipulate objects. So besides, users often need to complete the training task in a physical, uh, a limited physical space. And currently, the most popular locomotion approach to overcome such uh, physical limitation is point and part point and teleport method, uh, which is achieved via uh, hand controllers. However, it may not be ideal for skill training task, which hand-based task is dominant. Uh, because in such situation, user may experience physical and the cognitive stress if they also need to uh, activate the teleportation use their hands. Uh, and that can neg negatively impact their uh, primary task, uh, training task. And the previous study have explored some alternatives uh, approach to uh, locomotion approach to free users' hands, such like uh, walking place, uh, redirect walking, and some gaze and foot based approaches. However, these approaches have some limitations. Uh, for example, some of them may induce uh, motion sickness in user, and some uh, may cause uh, need some um, expensive additional uh, hardware. So this prevents them from being widely utilized in current VR skill training applications. So in this case, hmm, um, the goal of our study is to develop a locomotion approach that enable user to move around in a virtual training environment uh, without interrupt their uh, primary hand-based task. And we also aim to achieve this in a limited physical space, which is especially important for some, some training tasks that have uh, spatial constraints. And finally, we hope uh, so this method is accessible and it can be easily applied in uh, existing applications. Uh, so our solution uh, is called Maniloco. It involves transferring the hand teleport interaction to users' head and foot. So instead of using uh, eye tracker uh, and, and some gaze um, direction method, we utilize a head mounted display and the, the head orientation to control uh, positioning, which is a more accessible alternative. Because private study have found that both head orientation and the uh, gaze can be used to predict to target motion destination and they are coordinated when individuals are observing their environment or working. And moreover, our approaches uh, use a simple foot actions. Uh, users just need to take a step towards the objects to activate the teleport, and we introduce a specific offsite to get user back to the tracking center. Uh, so this make make uh, our method is suitable for a room tracking, a room scale tracking area. And before uh, implementing the methods, we uh, proposed several design considerations uh, focused on clarifying the potential barriers that may impact users' experience and the, the factors uh, that need to be taken into account when we create this method. So the first design consideration is, uh, is crucial to ensure the accuracy of the height localization. So to achieve this goal, we need to avoid the influence on the accuracy of the height localization uh, of the height of localization caused by um, some normal physiological gesture of user's head and also the influence caused by the foot activities. Uh, the second design consideration is, uh, is crucial to enhance the triggering accuracy. Well, because in typical VR experience, users often naturally scan the environment and they naturally take some uh, footsteps. Uh, 
Um, so therefore, to avoid accidental trigger of the locomotion is crucial to differentiate the intent, user's intent to uh, scan the environment and their intent to trigger the teleportation. Uh, finally, um, it's essential to ensure that user does not exceed the, the tracking space when even when they perform some food-based actions. Uh, then we follow three implementation steps to achieve this design consideration. Uh, so the first step focuses on locating the destination. So because many local locating the destination based on uh, the object the user intends to interact with. So we use a simple algorithm uh, instead of an eye tracker to let user locate objects. So specifically, we give every interactive objects in the, v the, v uh, in the VR scenario two bounding volumes a large outer volume and a small inner volume. So specifically, the large bonding volume aims to solve the problem that the head often slightly jetter. Uh, it also overcomes the challenge of locating uh, smaller or far objects. And the smaller inner bonding, uh, inner, uh, bonding volumes can make user feel little uh, resistance when they switch uh, to the different objects. And it's also elevating the situation that locating objects is shifted due to the large food step. Um, then the second implementation step focuses on detecting the foods, user's food activity uh, to trigger the teleportation. So firstly, the, uh, the teleport will be triggered if the user accumulates a certain distance towards their hand directions within a given time. Uh, and we conducted a preliminary study to identify the appropriate setting of the time and distance parameter. And this allowed many local uh, to judge whether the user want to take a teleport or they are just normally scanning the environment. Then uh, the third step aimed at achieving the room scale um, uh, tracking consideration. So the idea is instead of teleporting the user directly in front of the target object they want to interact with in the VR environment. Many local off-site users teleport destination in the VR environment to implicitly get them back to the, uh, the physical tracking center. And this design is based on users' uh, subconscious behavior because when they, uh, they will naturally adjust to the desired position once they are in an off-site position. And the off-site is calculated by based on the physical distance of the user's current position to the center of the physical tracking space as this equation shows. Uh, so here uh, we have a, a very short demo uh, uh, to showcase how this method works. Uh, this video is from our user testing. So I will play this video. In this video, the user stands at the center at the tracking area at the beginning, and he is asked to go to a table on his right side in the VR environment. So he takes a step to the right in the real world, and then he was transported to an offside position in the VR environment. And this offside custom uh, naturally takes a step to the left uh, to the desired position. And then we uh, conducted a user study uh, to investigate the performance of uh, our method and get a user's feedback. So specifically, we compared many local with point and teleport. Uh, 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 this is the most commonly used local motion approach for uh, limited physical space. Uh, and we created a three meter by uh, eight meter virtual laboratory scenario with, with a horizontal layout include a typical workbench that contains four tables placed side by side. And there were two containers with liquids in it placed in the middle of each table. Uh, so the users were provided with both textual and auditory instructional information. And the tracking area is, uh, is two by two meters, which means that if participants rely only on natural walking, they cannot reach to the, the target tables or the, the containers they need to interact with. And uh, after consulting with some chemistry experts, we designed a user task. And this task involves in a total of 15 steps. They can be uh, classified into three categories uh, based on the interaction types involved. So the first is the hand-only step. Uh, well, users need to grab some target containers and mix some different uh, liquids. 
And the second tab is the tab of um, uh, step is local motion only step. Well, such step only require user to move to another tables uh, without uh, hold any uh, up uh, containers in, the, in their hands. And finally is the hand and the local motion steps. Uh, well, such steps require simultaneously hand operations and locomotion. For example, a user will ask to uh, grab a container and uh, hold this, this container in their hand and transport to another table, from, uh, from, for example, from table A to table C. And we also distinguish the steps according to the hand involvement and the local locomotion distance. And the table on the right side show, oh, sorry, left side shows one example of the 15 step task. And there are 10 hand and locomotion step, which we are focused. And the other five steps were uh, designed to balance the workload of the participants. And we also employed a uh, variety of measures. Uh, so first we measure objective performance, uh, including task completion time, errors, and movement trajectory to access the efficiency and accuracy of this method. And then we uh, use some subjective measures, including user experience question, uh, motion sickness, and the presence. Uh, finally, we conduct a semi-structure interview uh, with the participants to get their preference and feedback on our method. Uh, so here are the results of, uh, oh, it's not very clear. Uh, so here are the results of the user study. So for the task completion time, we found two locomotion masters took similar time um, in completing one hand steps. Uh, however, in two hand steps, we found that participants significantly took less time with our method. And we interpret this as uh, our method allows participants better focus on their training task, their hand operations. Uh, and then is the errors. Um, uh, so from this result, we can find that many local result in a significant lower number of errors than point and teleport. So when using point and teleport method, we observe that some participants spill out the liquids within the container. So we consider this as uh, can measure how stable the participants' hand were and the failures can represent the sign of um, conflict between locomotion methods and their hand uh, operations. And another type of error, error we found when uh, participants were using point teleport was being moved to the wrong location. So in, we interpret this as participants had to pay attention to the liquid in the container. So, um, so they cannot control the location of the teleport very, very well. Um, but for uh, using many local method, we observed that some errors occurs in activating the trans transition. Uh, this is because Manilocal is a parameter-based detection method and thus may have some sensitivity issues. Uh, moreover, um, the, uh, this is a result of moving tracking. Uh, moving tracking. Uh, it shows that all participants could uh, explore the uh, a larger VR scenario with, uh, in a limited uh, tracking space. Then uh, it, this is the uh, user experience uh, results. Uh, there are eight subcategories that are relevant to our evaluation. Uh, so first, uh, we no difference was found between two methods in terms of dif difficulty to understand and operate. And we found that uh, Manilocal get a significant higher score for feeling in control and require fewer efforts than point teleport methods. So this bet uh, introducing a specific work action, uh, Manilocal did not require participants to exert more effort in it. And then the tiredness uh, results also revealed, revealed that Manilocal could uh, successfully release the stress on users' hands. And regarding the feeling of enjoyment, uh, a significant effect could not, could not be found, but we uh, received positive feedback about many local being fun and intuitive uh, from the interview. Besides, we found um, we found that point and teleport caused participants to have a feeling of being overwhelmed. Uh, this may be because the user need to adjust the position by making additional uh, transportation, and this process can make make participants feel overwhelmed. 
and finally both techniques got a low score for the feeling of frustrated. Uh, then is the result of presence and motion sickness. So uh, the results show that motion sickness sickness is significantly lower for using uh, our method. So this can be explained that we you, uh, users are physically uh, stationary when they navigate and move with only a joystick. Uh, but when using the many local participants uh, need to take some steps and they are uh, moving physically. So this could allow user to recover during the task. And uh, for the uh, presence, we did not observe any sig significant eff effect. Uh, so, uh, but uh, our method still have some limitations. So the first limitation is, uh, so now the use of locomotion is still in uh, one dimension. So all the targets are in their horizontal direction. But in the future, we would like to extend this method to a full functional uh, two dimension locomotion. And the second uh, limitation is that many local reduce, introduce some parameters and these parameters may significantly affect users experience uh, so now we use a universal number in the in, in 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 the current method but in the future user could be allowed to customize these parameters to uh, lower the errors and include uh, in, in improve their uh, performance um, and uh, then a uh, mini local is an object-based locomotion method that requires user to focus on the object first, and then they can active active the transport. And uh, this make made that uh, if uh, there are some occlusion between objects, or if the object is uh, far away or too small, that can lead to increase increase the difficulty in positioning the target objects. And finally, there are some shortcomings in the current evaluation of this study, because for now, we only uh, compare our method with the point teleport. But in the future, we, uh, it would be more convincing if we can, uh, and we plan to uh, compare our study with more similar uh, locomotion methods, such like uh, some method, uh, gaze-based gaze method and food-based method. So finally, it's the conclusion. Uh, so first, uh, we uh, developed a VR locomotion method for VR training application where hand interaction is dominant. So unlike traditionally use controller-based teleport uh, methods, which may conflict users' hand operation and negatively uh, affect their training outcomes, um, our method enable users to teleport to a remote object position by taking a step toward the object while looking at it, actually using height rather than uh, the gaze direction. Uh, then we uh, demonstrate the potential and the feasibility of the method uh, through a user study. And finally, due to the increasing number of VR laboratory skill training applications, uh, research on novel hand-free uh, locomotion methods will become more important. So we believe our study offered a useful step for the future investigation in this domain. Uh, so that's all the content for my presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks for this. Uh, so I'm wondering what uh, what you're actually testing. Are you testing against a system where people already have their hands up and then they need to point at a certain uh, direction and, and get there versus looking and then finding the fixed location? So it's, it's, it's manual tuning versus a fixed location, right? Uh, so could you repeat your question? Sure. So I'm, I'm, holding a, I'm holding a controller in one hand and I need to point to the place that I want to go. I need to aim and be correct about, about that. So right? that's the point and teleport. Yeah, so that's yeah. one. And the other is, is having a gaze to a location. There's a bounding box around the location. You show up there, right? Or do you actually need to tune your gaze? Um, uh, yes, to, for, for the our method, yes. the medical. Yeah, so user need to uh, look around and they need to make their higher direction to the object they want to interact with. Okay, but, but, they, but then you get stiction to the object, right? You, you, you basically, um, you immediately, um, uh, what's the word for this in English? Um, you immediately get fixed to the object once, once you have a certain radius around it, right? You don't need to actually be very accurate about the results. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, so what you're comparing here 
is manual dexterity versus um, some computer assisted system, right? It, it's not apples to apples, your comparison. Sorry, I didn't. On, on in, in one hand, what you're testing uh -huh. is how accurate your hand is, right? Uh -huh. And then the other is if you gaze in the general direction, the program already helped the user to get to, to the point, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the difference? Um, so, so that question is, is, is that question about the programming? Yeah, what, so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, yeah, so, um, <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, is what, what parameters are you separating here, right? Because it seems to me like the, the hand already has a certain amount of frustration built in mm -hmm. because the user is already fatigued when they're lifting their hands. It's a virtual liquid. They don't really get feedback. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, their feet are, are basically, you know, they're not doing any work. Um, and um, while they're not doing any work, the computer is already assisting them to, to, to you know, like to, 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 to land in the correct position. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm wondering if you isolated your parameters properly, right? Yeah, so I think your question is more about the technical, uh, technical part of the study. No, no, just the, the, just the, the study setup, that's all. Um, so, so on one hand, we, we're already we're not controlling for the fatigue that is built into the users. Yeah. Right? That that okay. So so I just wanted to, to to understand that part. Okay. So we're all on one hand we have we have a user who can like uh, trigger the activation very simply. On the other hand, they need to tune very carefully with their hand that is already fatigued, and that might be building into some of the. Uh, advantages that you see there um, by using your technique, which is which is great. I just wanted to know that that, that mm -hmm. is controlled. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a, a question about the, like, do you have any comments that this could be uh, generalizable uh, to a case where it's, well, I think one of the big limitations here is not only space, but you need to have your hands free, right? But there's a lot of value in the correcting of positions when you're teleporting mm -hmm. to try to allow people to have more space when they're walking around the living room. So do you, do you see any uh, ways to generalize this to a, let's say, traditional VR experience, like to take some of the findings uh, from this very specific scenarios like a general VR experience. Okay. Can you comment a little bit on future um, works from this? Thanks. Okay, so your question is asking how to generate this method to different scenarios? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Just comments. Uh, I wanted to just yeah, hear your yeah. thoughts about this. Yeah. Yeah, so from our uh, perspective, I, I, so we think that the first, uh, the, the most important thing to generate this method to different scenario is um, to expand this method to, that can be used uh, in a two-dimensional uh, locomotion. Because now this method can be only used in one-dimensional locomotion. So, so just like say, uh, uh, our uh, testing scenario is, uh, is a horizontal layout. But uh, there are a lot of uh, laboratory skill training. They have a, a work, workbench around them on, on maybe both sides or three sides. So three uh, uh, directions. So I think that's the most, uh, the most important thing uh, we need to do. And then we can generalize this method to different scenarios. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Sort of following up on that, what what are the challenges moving to two D? Why is that um, so? Uh, I I so because I'm not the technical uh, person, and I was uh, responsible for the design, the user testing, and the yeah. So that part, so I I, I sorry, I cannot give you more technical details on that. Yeah. Fair enough. Are there other questions? If not, then let's thank all of our speakers again. Thank you.